somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Et qui défendait la liberté d'expression. The moment you limit free speech is not free speech. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. Welcome to Clear and Present Danger, a history of free speech by Jakob Mshengama. Clear and Present Danger relies on the generous support of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, Fridor, and the Politiken Foundation. Episode 16. Expert Opinion with Michael Shermer. My son is nine years old and has just been given an old laptop. At the moment, he gets up at six in the morning before going to school in order to read and write about the theory of relativity. And the other day, he was given a home assignment in Christianity. Yes, that's a class in elementary school here in Denmark. He was asked to write a history of creation inspired by biblical accounts. Instead, he wrote a story based on the Big Bang Theory. In other words, my son is deeply interested in science, which is also the topic of today's expert opinion with Michael Shermer. Now, normally with expert opinions, I have a very clear idea of what questions to ask the guest, what the answers will be, and how to follow up. But today I'm moving on to shaky ground. Like so many, I take the advances brought about by science for granted. That goes for the very technology that makes it possible for you to listen to this podcast while driving in your car on a continent far away from where I'm recording this episode at this very minute. So my son's interest in science would have worried me if he didn't resemble me so much in appearance, because my gene pool is not primed to scientific understanding. If I were to be sent back to the Middle Ages, I would be able to tell people about all the wonders of modern civilization that awaited mankind down the road. But if they asked me to help them skip six or seven hundred years of painstakingly slow development, rather than burn me as a heretic, I would be no more useful than the local third-rate alchemist or astrologist. But in today's episode, we'll try to find out what, if any, relationship exists between science and freedom of speech and inquiry. We've scratched the surface a bit already by mentioning developments in ancient Greece, and we've seen how Greek thought and science helped spark a lost enlightenment in the Abbasid Caliphate, where an impressive number of Islamic polymaths contributed to a vast number of disciplines, including astronomy, medicine, mathematics, geography, and philosophy and whose efforts then contributed to the rediscovery and dissemination of Greek science and philosophy in the West, where the mix of universities and Aristotelian ideas proved a most productive mix, pushing the limits of permissible inquiry. All along this journey, there were serious tensions between philosophy and science on the one hand and religion on the other. We've seen how Islamic theologians and rulers set up barriers between two rationalist speculation on the one hand and revelation on the other, and how the universities of medieval Europe sought to police ideas and theses that went too far in challenging the accepted worldview. This meant that the advances in science and philosophy contributed to, but did not unleash, what we call the scientific revolution although that term, its meaning and history, is itself disputed. We've also mentioned the effect of the printing press, which helped disseminate ideas and improve the reliability of drawings and blueprints to the advancement of engineering and production, and the case of Copernicus and Galileo. But we've not more systematically examined the relationship between science and free speech. So with me to shed light on these questions is Dr. Michael Shermer, who's the author of a long list of books, including most recently The Heavens on Earth, but also The Moral Arc, The Believing Brain, and many others. Michael Shermer is also the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, a monthly columnist for The Scientific American, and a presidential fellow at Chapman University. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you on. 
Oh, well, thanks for having me. I, I, I like your show. I like what you do. It's important. Thanks. So I want to begin with what might seem to be a very, very basic question, but which I actually would have a hard time answering myself. And that is, of course, what is science? What is science? <laughs> right. That's the big question. Well, it's a tool for understanding the world, uh, a technique, a, a technology, as it were, a cognitive technology for answering questions about the natural world, providing natural explanations for phenomenon. And uh, it involves reason and logic, but also, importantly, empiricism. That is, or, uh, for it to be scientific, the, quest, the, the attempt to answer a question, for example, it would need to have some empirical method to get at an answer. It has to be testable. Or as Karl Popper put it, it has to be falsifiable. There must be some way to falsify the claim or else it's it's not really science. So what you talk about really exploded, I guess, with the scientific revolution, what we call the age of reason and the enlightenment. But human beings have invented stuff, have made progress and have used reason before these events. So would it be fair to say that science has been used before the scientific revolution and before you know, the skepticism that you identify, the trial and error, the empiricism and so on that you identify with science? Oh, for sure. Um, you can actually trace the employment of something like a scientific method to our Paleolithic hunter-gatherer ancestors uh, who, who, let's say, in tracking game, are testing hypotheses. Now, this is a point made... Uh, in an article for Skeptic Magazine, uh, which I discussed in my book, The Moral Arc, uh, uh, by a, a historian of science who's also an animal tracker, uh, Louis uh, Leidenberg, I think was his name, is his name, um, that, you know, if you're tracking an animal and you're, you know, uh, on, on the move for days and you're trying to figure out where the animal is and you find some footprints a place where the animal slept the night before you're you're making some inductive you're using some inductive reasoning to then make predictions based on some of the signs where that animal might have gone after it slept here for example or how old the footprints look like they are to to determine when it was last where you are and which direction it moved and and so forth and and you know, Carl Sagan made this point as well in um, his book, Demon Haunted World, that the, 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 this idea of, you know, gathering data, information about the world, forming some conclusions based on the data or information, making some predictions based on that, and then testing the predictions to see if they're true. Uh, that's what we do in our daily lives, in a sense. Uh, not in any formal way. We're not even really aware we're doing it in some stepwise fashion. But that is that is kind of what science is all about. How would you describe the great leap forward in antiquity in, in Greece? I mean, Greek thought in, in philosophy and at least primitive science have shaped scientific thought for millennia afterwards. What are the contributions of Greek thought to, to this? And do you think that the contributions or the sort of emergence of, of early science among the Greeks might have had something to do with the fact that they were also the ones who invented free speech? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's a pretty big question, actually. Historians of science uh, have debated this, uh, you know, from the Greek miracle of just pure genius, the first people to figure this out, uh, which is sort of a great man theory of history. Uh, and that's not not largely embraced anymore. It's it's more uh, th then there's some like geographical cultural explanations for why it was the Greeks, you know, that they they had these more splintered uh, city states that were more competitive, more isolated, um, and became you know sort of hotbeds of thought that could then um, you know disperse the information through their oral and written traditions and and it's spread that way so there they're you're, you're sort of taking the great men out of the picture and just saying it's culture it's geography literally islands of knowledge um and and maybe something in between those 
Um, you know, certainly the Greeks are not the first. The, the problem is, is that much of the information we have about other cultures before Greek, before the Greeks is, is gone or it's, it's dulcetary. And we don't have much. And again, before writing, you're going to have next to no information about what ancient peoples did along the lines of what I described of trying to make inductive reasoning about the world and then make predictions and then test those predictions. I'm quite sure that th that process goes back hundreds of thousands of years, possibly even before something like uh, uh, formal, uh, formal symbolic language. Uh, you know, it's a cognitive process, but you know, we have to, you know, we have to take what, what we have. So the ancient Greeks is certainly a good place <clears throat> to begin for Western, the development of Western culture and science. Uh, but, but of course, other civilizations had that in, you know, non-Western traditions and, and certainly, um, you know, the Islamic tradition of, of developing a rich science uh, while West, the Western world was, you know, in the midst of the Dark Ages after the fall of the Roman Empire. You know, much has been written about that as well. Yeah, that's a good jump off point for my, for my next question, because you're someone who's very critical of religion or, or at least religious authority and and religious arguments in shaping moral values for a, a modern society. But nonetheless, you seem to agree, from what I hear from you now, that Muslim states, but I would argue also Christians, have contributed to the development of science. I'm thinking of the sponsoring and spread of Aristotelian philosophy in the Abbasid Caliphate, where you had a number of really impressive polymaths and the medieval European universities with surprisingly liberal attitudes towards inquiry and reason that resulted in, in striking discoveries in mathematics and physics. You had these, the so-called Oxford calculators at, at Merton College, for instance, who did some impressive stuff with physics. So how much, um, how much credit should we give to Christians and Muslims when it comes to uh, science? Yeah, so uh, quite a bit. So here I would make a distinction between my opinions and comments about religion today and its effects on culture, politics, science, and so on. Uh, like when I critique creationists for uh, being anti-science and their attitudes toward evolutionary theory. I, I would separate those concerns from, let's say, when I wear my hat as a historian of science, and say, yes, it's a fact that uh, Western Christendom laid the foundations for the scientific revolution, as did the humanist movement in uh, the you know, 13th and 14th centuries before Copernicus and Galileo and all, uh, and all that. So uh, these movements, these modern movements, have uh, long threads that go back historically that I'm happy to recognize. And and, and acknowledge that the integration, say, of Aquinas uh, with certain Christian ideas, particularly in the thought of Thomas Aquinas, obviously has a, a big role in the history of science. But I think my modern point would be that religion by itself doesn't have the tools to answer questions about the natural world that are as effective as those of science. And I would just separate the two. You know, religion so much depends on uh, authority and ultimately upon revelation based on the, you know, holy scriptures. And although there may be individuals along the way who were religious, but also open to empiricism and reason and, and you know, and, and, and secular arguments, the, the, the methods of religion itself is not conducive to answering empirical questions. It just doesn't have in its DNA built into it uh, this kind of falsifiability. We have to rely on evidence, and if the evidence changes, we'll change our mind. Uh, they simply won't. You know, if you're a Christian, you have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And that ultimately is an article of faith. There is no control group an experimental group. There's no epidemiological studies of this. There's no, uh, you know, gathering of information and so on in any kind of testable way. 
to to get at that question, you know, was Jesus really resurrected? And if we did, when you apply logic to it, it doesn't really hold up. And and nevertheless, they're going to believe it anyway because that's part of their faith. So that's what I mean when I when I make a distinction between religion and science. I just mean in the methodologies, the philosophy uh, behind it, not not the historical trends, which are certainly there. Does that mean you would say that the the great contributions that helped lay the foundation for the scientific revolution by both Muslims and, and Christians, that was despite of rather than because of religion, or is it more complicated than so? Well, I would say in spite of in the deeper philosophical sense of not having built into it, uh, you know, an ultimate commitment to empiricism in which, as Richard Feynman famously says that I quote, uh, in the believing brain, if it disagrees with the experiment, it is wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. <laughs> that embodies the modern scientific method. And although, again, you may find some religious people, Christians or or are Muslims historically who kind of followed Feynman's uh, method there, but 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 inherent in religion itself is something quite different from that. You know, based on authority rather than empiricism, and um, you, you know, and, and although I, I will temper that by saying, say, because we're so critical of Islam right now, ever since nine eleven. Uh, it's been kind of the elephant in the room, and you know people are sensitive about criticizing it. I, I think we can acknowledge uh, that Islam had a, a you know a huge role in keeping alive uh, you know the Greek traditions and Aristotle and so on and and the tradition of learning and made their own important discoveries in mathematics and science. That's all there. In, in, in fact, it's there to the point where many scholars are say asking what happened. To Islam, I mean, how did it, you know, kind of lurch backwards to the Dark Ages, seemingly with this, you know, radical commitment to um, jihad and and you know, sort of a fundamentalist reading of the Quran and and this kind of barbaric uh, attitudes toward women and and, uh, and and culture and so on. What happened? Because they used to have this kind of golden age. So it's entirely possible, and in fact, historically is the case um, that Islam and and Western Christendom did play a role. Now, at that point, let me also point out that you know Christianity is rather different today than it was during the Scientific Revolution and even the Enlightenment, in the sense that it has evolved. Religions evolve, which tells us something that even even if the adherents claim that they're committed to the you know foundational beliefs of of uh, the church or or the holy book they don't they evolve along with culture so again it's another point how come Islam hasn't gone through its own enlightenment uh, like who like Christians Christianity went through the enlightenment and came out far less violent than it used to be but you know if you look back at how Christians treated Jews and women and minorities and so on centuries ago, they were just as barbaric, if not more, than than modern um, Muslim terrorists and jihadists. So something happened. Something happened good for Christianity in it, and we'd like to see that happen with Islam as well. You don't have to aim for abolishing all religion to have a better civilization. You just have to civilize the religions to become less barbaric and violent. So let's talk about the scientific revolution, because it seems to me that it means different things to different people and historians and of science sort of debate whether it's even a relevant term. But you use the term the scientific revolution. So when would you say that the scientific revolution took place? Who were the main actors? And most importantly, what did it entail? Yeah. Um, so, well, you've put your finger on a, an important point there, historians of science debate not only when it happened, but whether there even was an it, the it here being uh, a dramatic scientific revolution, certainly it's nothing like 
say, the discovery of DNA in 1953 by Crick and Watson, we can point our finger at it and go, there, the, you know, the revolution in genetics or genetic engineering or uh, genome sequencing and all that begins right there, you know, in that year uh, with that publication. There's nothing like that for, for something as big as the scientific revolution. Um, and so it debate, it's debatable where you, where you want to put it. You know, I, most historians say it, but at the very least with, you know, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, you know, that kind of cl- uh, constellation of, of mega superstar scientists. But you can go back earlier to Francis Bacon and his great work, the, you know, Nova Morganon, the, the new organ, the new organ of science. Um, and, and my humanist friends, in this case, scholarly humanists in the Erasmus tradition, they put it back centuries before that. Uh, with, say, the earliest analysis of, of biblical texts using philological uh, reasoning and, and testing of words and language and, and analyzing it that way, that, that lays the foundation for trying to get at understanding, you know, what's true about, um, you know, something that happened in the past or some empirical claim. And uh, so, you know, it's a big picture. I mean, you, you could describe it as going on for centuries uh, or even, again, bring, you know, bringing Aristotle back into it through Aquinas. You know, that takes us back even further to the 13th century. Um, but, but again, you know, I think if we, if we want to use the word revolution, you know, something big happened that changed, it, it would certainly be with, um, you know, Copernicus overturning uh, the Ptolemaic system, um, and but more importantly, following him, you know, Brahe, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton, in the sense that the important thing here is the understanding that the universe is knowable through our senses and our reasoning, and that it's governed by natural laws that we can understand. And from that, we can begin to manipulate the world to the betterment of humanity. There you have a nexus of science and and philosophy or science and reason between the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. Uh, That something there is, that's what changed everything. Regardless of how far back you want the historical threads to go, that's all fine and super interesting from a historical perspective. But the big changes really came after Newton, uh, unified through his mathematics, his great Principia Mathematica, that the experiments Galileo was running in labs about the effects of gravity on Earth could be unified with the observations made by Kepler, Brahe, and Copernicus about what was going on in the solar system, and then uniting those together in, in a, a worldview of this mechanical clockwork universe. That's what led to the Enlightenment idea of you know, understanding all aspects of the world, not just the physical world, but the biological world, including medicine, and then the social world, including you know, politics and and economics, and and that's really what changed the world. And does this also have then a consequences for what we would later on call free speech, but which we might at this point in time call something like freedom of inquiry, because we don't have a right of free speech at this point in, in the sense that we recognize it now as a constitutional right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the, the concept or term free speech w- w- would be foreign to somebody centuries ago, but the idea is that um, you know this sort of open peer commentary, open debate, that ideas are debatable, that you can challenge authorities with arguments and evidence that contradicts them. Um, that that is one of the aspects that evolved during the scientific revolution in response to the problem of authority, which is that they the authorities get it wrong. And, and when they do, there has to be a way to change it. This is the other aspect about religion. It doesn't have built into it um, a, a kind of algorithm of change such that you know, if authority says 10 different things and six of them are right and four of them are wrong, you know, we can go ahead and change the four that are wrong. 
based on evidence. There's nothing like that. Once you've committed to the 10 dogmatic positions, you have to stick to those unless the head of the church, like the Pope, says, oh, never mind, we, we've changed our minds about this or that. Um, so, you know, the, the aspect of science that makes it so productive is that that's all it does. It's willing to change its, its mind on, on any of those. And that's what really with Galileo, and, and I, I talk in, in Believe Your Brain about the, you know, the, the battle of the, of the books, the book of authority and, and, and the, you know, and the book of, of, you know, empiricism or, or, or evidence or nature. Um, that, that's what changed when Galileo was uh, trying to get his fellow Vatican astronomers to look through his tube. It was before the telescope, it was naked eye uh, astronomy, which is really difficult. Tycho Brahe apparently is the, the best ever at this. You mentioned Galileo, and he's, of course, the, the classic example of the clash between science and religion, though his punishment might have had more to do with, with mocking the Pope and, and his rather uh, insufferable attitude than challenging the geocentric worldview. But, but how should we assess Galileo's importance to science and scientific freedom, respectively? Well, yes, that, that's exactly right. It, 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 this science and religion is a war between the two with Galileo as the archetypal uh, warrior defeating the, the mighty Pope and all that stuff, even as he was jailed and tortured for his beliefs is nonsense. That's not at all what happened. Uh, it's a much more interesting and, and, and subtle uh, history there that I wrote about in, in The Believing Brain. And you know, there's whole books on this now by professional historians of science that nuance it even more. Uh, and it, it certainly is the case that uh, what really got him into trouble was mocking the Pope. Uh, but he wasn't tortured. And uh, it, it was you know sort of a house arrest where he could just be at home working. And in fact, he did make contributions after that still to science uh, that led to important developments by Newton a century later. Uh, but it, but But the larger picture, though, is still has an element of truth in the sense that this was the time when the culture in general of learning was making this transition from the book of authority to the book of nature. Uh, that is from uh, authorities, whether they're church or, or even scientific authorities held sway to the authorities don't matter. What matters is whatever nature says. And, and, and so the, this pendulum has swung back and forth historically, um, and what and Galileo was in the middle of it, shifting toward empiricism, toward nature, toward let's just look through the telescope and see the way things actually are, rather than the way they're supposed to be according to the authority. Now, to to modern ears, that sounds completely obvious. Well, of course we should do that. But the other uh, point I make in in my book uh, on this is is that this can actually get you into trouble when your data is not very good. And so in the case of Galileo, he could see spots on the sun and shadows on the moon, and uh, which told him that this Aristotelian idea of a perfect cosmos without blemish was not true. Uh, there's blemishes on the sun. There's shadows on the, the moon. The moon can't be perfectly smooth. It's got mountains on it and craters. So what, what, what are those? How can that be? And then he noticed through his telescope that Jupiter uh, had moons going around it, you know, the so-called Galilean moons, uh, as they're called now because he discovered them. But, but how could that be if the Earth is the center of all you know, revolutions, of rotations of other heavenly bodies? Um, and, and so he made great inroads with that, including the phases of Venus. And, you know, he made some pretty good arguments and presented pretty strong data to support Copernicus um, over Ptolemaic uh, uh, solar system which was debatable at that time. But where he got into trouble on this empiricism question is with Saturn. When you look at Saturn through a crappy little telescope like he had, it's not at all clear uh, that it has rings because the, the, the resolution was so poor, all you could see was these kind of two things sticking out on the side of Saturn. And so there were two problems here. One was, was lousy data. And two, there's no theory of planetary rings. No one knew about rings around planets. So no one was even thinking of that. That wasn't even a concept in anybody's brain 
to then take that data and put it into that box. So he concluded, I have observed Saturn is threefold. That is, he finally decided it was one big planet and two smaller planets or you know large moons going around the big planet. And he was wrong, and it took you know another half a century of better telescopic observations and finally a theory of planetary rings to, to make that um, leap. So that shows you that this idea that the facts should just speak for themselves and never be filtered through theory is also false. That's taking empiricism too far. And so now, you know, we're trying to strike that right balance by recognizing through the work, of, particularly of historians of science, that, you know, you can get into trouble if you have too much emphasis on authority or too much emphasis on pure empiricism or, or data, because the data don't just speak for themselves. They have to be filtered through some theory. So we need both data and theory. And that's what constitutes the modern uh, methods of science is that you know, some balance between those. You have another example, an earlier example, I think, of Columbus when he arrives at what he thinks is India, how he sort of interprets this environment through his confirmation bias, his preconceived ideas of, of where he is, is able to disregard uh, all the facts that would suggest that, that, in fact, he's somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, to modern, again, to modern ears, it's like, how could Columbus possibly think he was in India? I mean, he's in America. Surely they're different. Well, <laughs> not if you think you're in India and you can take, uh, you know, and look at this plant or that animal and kind of see it through the lens of I'm in India. So this must be some version of an Indian plant or animal or whatever. And that's exactly what he did. And, you know, we all do this. Um, we're just not, a, usually we're just not aware of it. So one of the um, revolutionary discoveries of cognitive psychology just in the last 25 years it has been to reveal how unreliable our senses are when we're filtering information through preconceived ideas, paradigms, theories, hypotheses, whatever. Um, the way you look at the world very much determines what that, how the data is interpreted. Back to your earlier question about free speech, the reason we have to be able to speak openly without fear of retaliation for challenging an authority is because of this problem that we're likely to be wrong about most of the things we believe. And this includes scientists. There's nothing special about scientists that makes them less biased. They may be trained in science and, and told, be careful about experimenter bias and so on, but that rarely makes any difference when you're the actual observer or participant in the experiment. The method, the science, the process, the social process of science itself uh, in, uh, insists that, you know, if you don't figure out the errors you, you might make, uh, somebody else will. And that's why you have to have this kind of openness to letting other people look at your data and to, you know, laying out exactly what you did in your research, where you got that data, how, how it was collected, what the conditions were, what the temperature was, how many subjects you had, you know, which were, and, and how they were selected into the, each of the different uh, experimental and control groups and, and, uh, and on and on. All those details have to be put out there because there's a good chance you made mistakes. And by doing that, you allow others to, to, to catch those mistakes or you force yourself to look for those errors. And, you know, and when scientists are, you know, forming hypotheses and so forth, as this is put in a kind of noble way, really what they're doing is just spitballing ideas. And most of those ideas are going to be wrong. So it's safe to say, you know, that most scientists are wrong about most things most of the time. And, and they're the ones that are trained to, to do this. Um, and, you know, and so the, so the process of science is really eliminating the wrong ideas and what's left standing. Now, I have to be careful the way I say this. I wouldn't say what's left standing is the truth. Uh, the way Karl Popper uh, described it as conjecture and refutation. That was the phrase he used. Conjecture, forming hypotheses, or as I just said, spitballing ideas, throwing them out there. And then refutation. Most of them get refuted. What's left standing is what's least likely to be false. Now, so again, maybe, maybe if you want to say 
it's probably true with a small t, okay. Or, you know, has a higher probability of being true again with a small t, that's fine. Uh, but it's all, the whole thing stems from this problem of how the human mind works in interaction with nature. I think what you said there is, is nicely summed up by Jonathan Rauch in Kindly Inquisitors, which is, is one of my favorite books on free speech, where he speaks about liberal science and he defines it as, quote, a society which has accepted skeptical principles will accept that sincere criticism is always legitimate. In other words, if any belief may be wrong, then no one can legitimately claim to have ended any discussion ever. In other words, no one gets the final say. That, to me, is a good summation of what you said and really shows sort of the relationship between science and, and, and free speech. Yeah, Jonathan Rausch's book is one of my favorite all-time books as well, Kindly Inquisitors. Uh, it was just released, by the way, on audio with Penn Jillette doing the reading because he's a, he's a big civil libertarian and free speech guy as well. And he does a great uh, rendering of Jonathan's great words Um, yes, I like the phrase liberal science, although today, you know, the word liberal is so packed with political implications and, and emotions, and uh, I wouldn't use that word now for anything uh, just because people have in their head a lot of connotations. But the idea by, of liberal being, meaning open, open to challenge, open to dispute and disputation, debate, You know, that, that is absolutely the core of science. In fact, that would just make it a redundant phrase, liberal science. Science is, by definition, liberal, in, in, meaning open to change, open to, you know, new ideas and, and so on. Now, I should also make a, a note that conservative, that science is also very conservative, again, not in the political sense, but in the sense that most new ideas are wrong. So the idea that You know, science is always changing, and scientists once thought this, now they think that, and so we can't trust science. It's always changing. That that's also not true. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the more well-founded a scientific theory is, the less likely it's going to be overturned. Not impossible, um, but you know, for example, the theory of evolution, or say the Big Bang theory, these things, these are so well supported now that the chances that they're wrong, you know, completely wrong, and that we're going to have another major revolution is very, very, very slim. Not impossible. More likely we'll get something like a, you know, kind of a tweak on it. So, some, something like what Einstein did with uh, Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian physics. You know, he didn't, it, it wasn't that he showed that Newton was wrong. It's that he added to it. I think of it as more complementary than, than refutation. That, you know, at, at, at high speeds, you know, general relativity and you know, and, or with quantum mechanics, tweaking it at the, at the smaller end of things. These aren't refutations of Newton. You know, Newton, Newtonian mechanics still works pretty well for describing macro objects at normal speeds and so forth, uh, or normal sizes, middling sizes, you might say. And, 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 and the theory of evolution as Darwin conceived of it is also pretty much in the main still the case. You know, Darwin was wrong about this or that. He had no mechanism of, of, He didn't know about genetics, for example, so how natural selection uh, actually operates inside of a body. You know, he didn't know anything about that. Uh, so, but it's not that he's wrong. It's just that the system has been tweaked and fine-tuned and improved and so on. So when somebody comes to me with a new theory of physics, I get these almost weekly. You, you just can't believe that, pe you know, that people think uh, that they can th overthrow centuries of science. I get these letters, you know, Newton was wrong and Einstein was wrong and Stephen Hawking and Feynman were wrong, and I have this new theory of physics, you know, and I'll share the Nobel Prize with you if you help me with the math, you know. <laughs> you know I just tell them, look, you're, you're talking to the wrong guy. First of all, I'm not a mathematician or a physicist, and second of all, I'm pretty sure you're wrong even before I open your file to see what it is you're doing, uh, simply because, uh, you know, th this has already been worked out for centuries and tested and, and ex experiments and so on. Somebody, if, if Newtonian or Einstein, if Einstein was wrong, we'd know we would know it by now. So in that sense, science is conservative because most new ideas that people come up with are wrong. And the tried and true theories we hold now have been tested so many times that we, we can have a high level of confidence that they're true with a small t or, or very unlikely to be false.
there's one striking moment in the moral arc where you describe how advances in human understanding of cause and effect leads to a fundamental change in how supposed witches were were understood and treated at a period where where thousands mostly women were tortured and burned could you elaborate on that and perhaps the effect on superstitious beliefs in in general yeah so here in the moral arc i'm i'm kind of picking up where i left off in the believing brain by applying this idea that Uh, the scientific method was developed to better understand the world. Uh, And in the moral arc, I showed how that was uh, picked up in the Enlightenment to also explain the social world, the psychological world, the economics and political world, and so on, through what I call the witch theory of causality, that if you believe that plagues and disasters and famines and disease and and accidents and, and, and trauma and injury and so on are all caused by, you know, women cavorting with demons in the middle of the night. And then you're either insane or you lived 500 years ago in, in Western Christendom when everybody thought that that was the case. So, but instead of condemning these, uh, our ancestors as being ignorant idiots, morons, <laughs> um, you know, that just superstitious, um, beasts uh, of ignorance no uh, they, they just had a mistaken understanding of causality that you know we now understand pretty well what causes famines and disease and contagions and and accidents and, and and the weather and so on we don't need demons anymore it's kind of a god of the gaps argument you know we're filling in those gaps we don't have to bring in god or demons or satan or witches or anything like that and really, that's what we've been doing for centuries is closing those, filling those gaps and getting rid of the supernatural elements such that there's really no place anymore for the supernatural. We have no need of that hypothesis, so to speak. And really, that's all what that's what science has been doing. So the Enlightenment, Enlightenment humanism is really just the application of science to human uh, problems and solving them. And that's what we've been doing so well. Not perfectly. You know, it's not a perfect uh, linear curve upwards or, or asymptotic curve to the, you know, perfection, nothing like that. But um, the moral, there is a, an arc to the moral universe and it is bending toward justice for very good reasons because we're, we've discovered through science, uh, you know, better ways to live than other ways. Not, not, not utopia, you know, not perfect ways, but, but better, just better ways. Just to sort of go back to the relationship between science and scientific freedom or free speech, how should we think of that relationship? We've danced around it, obviously, but is it science that paves the way for uh, free speech and inquiry, or is it the gradual loosening of censorship and intolerance that paved the way for science, or should we think of it as a as a process of, of cross-fertilization? I think it's cross-fertilization. I think that's a, a good way to think about it. Uh, certainly, when we think of free speech as embodied in the First Amendment of the Constitution uh, as drafted in the founding of the United States, you know, that, that had more political motives. But what was behind it, I still claim, is, is more this scientific history in the sense that uh, these founding fathers, Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Hamilton, um, and Madison and so on, they, they, they were all steeped in uh, classical learning, which included not only uh, you know, the, the, the Greek learning, uh, but also you know, sci- science is, is, was taught at the time, just the best science of the day. Um, you know, Jefferson was a scientist. Uh, Thomas Paine, he was a scientist. Now, they wouldn't have used that word. The word scientist wasn't even invented until the mid-19th century. No one would have used that word. But they, they, they were called natural philosophers, that is, philosophers who deal in nature, the natural world. Natural philosophers were what we would today call scientists. And, you know, they, they, uh, they had an early understanding of cognitive science, cognitive psychology. Uh, you know, how, how does the mind work? They had theories about this. And, and those theories influenced how we should structure a political system. You know, if people are a certain way, then we know we're going to have to have laws. We're going to have to enforce the laws because people will respond to punishments or respond to reinforcements. And, you know, so they kind of laid it out like this and they had a, an understanding uh, along the lines of what I just described that, you know, people are often mistaken 
and they can't agree on things because they have different theories about how they look at the world. You look at the world one way, I look at the world a different way, even though you and I are staring at the same thing. Well, Jefferson understood that, and you know, and people like um, Hamilton were uh, and Adams were deeply concerned about factions forming in political systems because people have a different view of the world, even when they're looking at the same thing. So we have to have a way to prevent any one faction from gaining too much power because of these biases and then, you know, the inherent desire to have power over others. And that's why they invented these divisions of uh, this, you know, sort of separation of powers and, and the, to prevent any one organization, any one institution from getting too much power. You know, and that goes back to, to John Locke and his whole associationist theory of psychology and, and you know, and and the blank slate and all that, uh, his theory of human nature is what gave him his theory of government. That you know, a century later, uh, ended up in the Constitution and, and in the ten, first ten amendments to the Constitution. All that is based on a scientific theory of human nature, and it's it's an, as I describe all this in the Moral Arc. It, it's an amazing history, and how intertwined politics is with with science, not not just psychology, but also, you know, the physical, the physical universe. You have a good example of, of how, is it Benjamin Franklin that edits uh, Thomas Jefferson's version of, of the Declaration of Independence in order to have it sound more like science than revelation? Yeah, let me look that up. Let's see. Uh, right. In his, in his biography of Benjamin Franklin, Walter Isaacson recounts the story of how the term self-evident came to be added to Jefferson's original draft by Franklin on Friday, June 21st, 1776. Wow, that's just a couple of weeks before the 4th of July. Uh, the most important of his edits was small but resounding. He crossed out using heavy backslashes that he often employed the last three words of Jefferson's phrase, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable and changed them to the words now enshrined in history. We hold these word truths to be self-evident. The idea of self-evident truths was one that drew less on John Locke, who was Jefferson's favored philosopher, than on the scientific determinism espoused by Isaac Newton and on the analytic empiricism of Franklin's close friend, David Hume. In what became known as Hume's Fork, the great Scottish philosopher, along with Leibniz, and others had developed a theory that distinguished between synthetic truths that describe matters of fact, such as London is bigger than Philadelphia, and analytic truths that are self-evident by virtue of reason and definition. The angles of a triangle equal 180 degrees. All bachelors are unmarried. By using the word sacred, Jefferson had asserted, intentionally or not, that the principle in question, the equality of men in their endowment by their creator with inalienable rights, was an assertion of religion. Franklin's edit turned it instead into an assertion of rationality. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> I love that example. And, and Franklin was the greatest scientist of his age. Uh, you know, electricity and well, Jefferson would have to be up there as well. But the point is that, you know, these great... Uh, political theorists of the founding of the United States were, in fact, the greatest scientists of their age. You can't separate the two. No, I, I love that link back to Newton or from Newton to the Declaration of Independence. That's quite powerful. Yeah, again, it, it, the idea that the universe is knowable and we can know it and then take that knowledge and apply it to you know, living better, that, that's it. That's the core right there. All right, Michael. Thank you very much for taking the time. It's been a real pleasure to have you uh, on.